Good morning. In the last service, as we were passing, Jay said, top that. <laughs> he didn't say anything this time, so apparently Rodney didn't do as good of a job. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Um, good morning. We are walking through a new, uh, relatively new series. Uh, we started last week looking at the trials of Jesus. And this week we're talking about how Jesus was observed, he was heard by people, but he wasn't really understood. He wasn't really known. And it got me thinking about other instances in stories and in in movies and stuff like that where somebody was seen but not really understood. And it reminded me of the classic film, Harry and the Hendersons. Has anybody seen Harry and the Hendersons? This is the first time you'll ever hear Jesus compared to Harry, to Bigfoot. Um, (laughs) But it's happening. And so in the movie, Harry and the Hendersons, Bigfoot comes to live with a suburban family. And John Lithgow plays the dad. And John Lithgow's like a, a dad with a, with a new puppy. He's the only one that doesn't want the puppy. Everybody else loves Harry, thinks he's great. But Harry's Bigfoot in a house and he's destroying everything. He gets scared of stuff. It's all quite dramatic. But then John Lithgow really winds up loving Harry. And what's really sad is at the end of the movie, they realize Harry can't stay. He's, he's uh, Bigfoot in a big suburban city, Right. So you just can't, people want to take advantage of him. People don't understand him. So they have to take him back to the woods. And so they take him back and and Harry doesn't understand. He wants to stay. And so eventually John Lithgow just has to start berating him and be like, we don't love you. We never wanted you. Go away. But then you see the pain on his face. You see the tears. And he really is not saying the truth. He's just doing it for Harry's good. And again, all joking aside, at some point in your life, some, many of us, I think all of us, have felt like Bigfoot in a suburban house. Just kind of not really understood, not seen really well, not for what you really are. People try to take advantage of you. People don't love you. They misunderstand you. And there's this feeling of being sort of, of dissonance, right? You're, you're out of place. And, and you're kind of marching to the beat of your own drummer and, and all this stuff. And it's just very difficult. I know I felt that way before. If you've been to, to middle school, you live that way for like three years. It's just brutal. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how Jesus is, not just his death, his burial, and his resurrection, but everything he goes through with the trials. I want us to talk about how Jesus' sacrifice helps free us so that we can be known and understood by him and by other people as well. So we're in Matthew chapter 26 verses 57 to 68. We're just going to look at three interactions. Uh, And the first one is Jesus is seen, but he's not known. He's seen, but he's not known. Verse 57, then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. This is the second of three religious trials and the second of six overall trials that Jesus is going to go through. And this is before Caiaphas, the Roman appointed high priest. Last week was before Annas, who is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. So you follow those relationships? So now we're before Caiaphas and the the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of of the temple, they're going to be all in force next week. But they're starting to gather here some, some members trying to get a conviction out of Jesus. And this is, what's happening is the story opens up, rather than opening up on Caiaphas, it opens up on Peter. It opens up on Peter. And Peter's kind of in a weird situation. He's following along, the the way the Greek reads, it kind of sounds like it's tentative. He's kind of like stalking in the shadows, trying to see what's going to happen, because Peter is a disciple of Jesus. He's torn. He wants to see what's going to happen, but he doesn't want to meet the same fate that it seems like Jesus is going to meet. And it says something at the end of verse 58. It says, he sat with the guards 
to see the end. I'd never noticed this before this week, sitting with the guards to, to see the end. Peter's sitting there and he thinks this is the end of it. This is the end of Jesus's ministry. This is the end of Jesus's life. Everything that, that, that he had put into this relationship is just gonna go by the wayside. And what's really sad about that is this is grief. This is grief for Peter. This is his friend. He spent every day with this guy for three whole years. They've eaten food together. They slept in the same house together. They know one another. He's seen him every day. And he, what's more is he believes. He genuinely believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He thought Jesus was going to change everything. And now it seems like nothing is going to change. It seems like Peter's back to the wrong horse. And so he's waiting to see the end. On the other hand, you have Caiaphas, who is also there to see the end, but he is not waiting to see the end. Caiaphas is there to make sure that the end happens. He is there to stop Jesus once and for all. It is the end of Jesus's ministry. It's going to be the end of his life. We're not dealing with this guy anymore. He's made a mockery of the establishment. He's made a mockery of me, and I'm tired of it. Caiaphas is done. And what might look like on the surface, a lot of incompetence is actually a really intricate sort of uh, legal narrative that's taking place. So it says that they, they were looking for witnesses, but false witnesses came forward. Now, it might sound like they're supplying these witnesses with stories, and they're so bad at it that they can't get them to agree. It's like, come on, can you not remember the story we fed you? That's not what's happening. According to Jewish law, in order to convict someone of a capital crime, two or more witnesses had to agree. That's from Deuteronomy 19.15. And so what they're doing is, as the, remember, this is all happening overnight. So the Sanhedrin trial happens at dawn on Friday. So this is all overnight, Thursday and into Friday, okay? And so throughout this evening, people are showing up at Caiaphas's house, and they're there to hear the trial. And I imagine that as they're coming in, maybe some of the high priests, maybe the chief priests are bringing with them some of the scribes. They're like, hey, this is my neighbor, and he says he heard Jesus do this. Or this guy knows this guy, and he says this. And according to the, uh, the law, all these people, two or more had to agree. And so all night long, they're sifting through this testimony, like a lawyer. Well, we can't, we can't do that. We can't, that. That doesn't agree with this. Now, you might say, wow, they're following like a legal, this is really cool. Like maybe the, the, the priests aren't that bad. No, they're, they're terrible. They have already determined that Jesus is going to die. They're just crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's because they want this to be legally admissible to both the religious establishment that will convict him for religious crimes and the Roman establishment, which will convict him for political crimes. So it's all got to be above board, but they're going to ensure that it happens. And finally, these two guys show up and they say, we have heard Jesus say that he's going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And for Caiaphas and the gang, this is perfect. Because this is an attack on the temple, which an attack on the temple is an attack on God because God dwells in the temple. His presence is in the temple. That's where the sacrifice takes place. To do anything against the temple is to have a high-handed sin against God. And so this is perfect for the religious purposes, but it's also perfect for the political purposes. Rome would get upset about this, not only because this is a public place where people gather and it could cause an uprising and an uproar, it's also perfect because attached to the temple is a fortress. It's called the Antonia Fortress. And it is where the Roman garrison in Jerusalem is stationed. So if you attack the temple, you attack the garrison. And if you attack the garrison, that's an attack on Caesar. They have everything they need to go to the governor and say, this man is a credible threat. He is a terrorist and he deserves to die. You couple that with the anti-establishment statements that he's made. You couple that with the overturning of the tables in the temple. You couple that with uh, how he said that he's greater than the temple. You have all the evidence that you need to get a conviction. And that's exactly what they do. And that's why Caiaphas says, don't you have anything to say for yourself? Don't you want to refute these claims? And Jesus remains silent. He remains silent. This story opens looking at two people, Peter and Caiaphas. 
and their perception of Jesus. And the really sad thing is, these guys see Jesus, but they don't know him. Not really. Peter, like I said, spends all this time with Jesus. He gets to know Jesus, supposedly, but he doesn't understand his mission. He doesn't understand his purpose. He doesn't understand really why he's there. And Caiaphas just sees him as a threat. Peter sees him as a burden because Peter made this commitment at the end of John 13. He tells Jesus, I'm going to go to death with you. And that vow is now being called in probably way earlier than Peter expected. You know how you make a flippant ca uh, casual comment over dinner? Like, yeah, I'll drive you home. And then all of a sudden you're like, and I'm driving you home. And I, you didn't realize you lived way on out there. <laughs> like in Forney or something. Those of you who commute from Forney, we love you. On the other hand, you have Caiaphas. Caiaphas is trained to look for the Messiah, and he doesn't get it. The really sad part about the whole thing is that both of them know that Jesus is supposed to die. They know from God that Jesus is supposed to die. Peter knows it because he's been told by Jesus himself three times, I'm going to be handed over to the religious leaders. When we get to Jerusalem, they're going to crucify me, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. So Peter knows explicitly the plan. He's been told three times. How many of you have people in your family that you've told the plan numerous times and they still don't get, out get the plan? That's Peter. Caiaphas, on the other hand, had a prophecy. It is uttered from his lips that Jesus will die for the good of the nation. He knows he's supposed to die. And the way Caiaphas interprets that is, I'm going to offer him up as like a peace offering to Rome. I'm going to paint this guy as a guy that we're going to reject because he's going to claim to be king of the Jews and all this stuff. Both of them know he's supposed to die. Both of them misinterpret it. And this points to two applications that we can have for today. One is that by looking at Jesus, it is possible to be surrounded by people who share your last name, share your blood, share good times with you, share your home with you, share your workspace with you, and they see you all the time and they don't know you. It is possible to be seen by all these people and not known by any of them, to be completely alienated from them and to wish that you were known by them, to wish that, that you did have some kind of connection with them. And it looks like different things. Sometimes it looks like you walking in some play and people are like, hey guy, hey fella, hey lady, what's my name? What's my name? You don't really know me. Sometimes it looks like being completely dismissed. You ever have the, the, where you tell a story, it's like, yeah, I got pulled over the other day. It was going a little too fast. And you have the one friend who's like, well, let me tell you about the time I got pulled over. I was doing like 90 on George Bush and da, 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 da. And they're like trying to like one up your story. If you don't have that friend, you probably are that friend. <laughs> this is a suggestion. Or you come home from a long day and you're telling your spouse about the story that happened to you that day. You're like, man, this happened to me and I don't know what to do about this situation. And they chime in, they got their tool belt on, they're like, well, let me fix that for you. I'm gonna tell you how to fix it. And you're like, I don't need you to fix it, I need you to listen. Or you get a gift from somebody and you can tell that they're like just a kind of a, they, they weren't really thinking about you as a person, they were just getting a gift for somebody, right? And so you get like their Christmas candle that they got last year that they just haven't burned yet. And they're like, here you go. We got these this Christmas gift. Thanks. It smells like pumpkins. Cool. Peter saw Jesus every day. Caiaphas was trained to look for him. And they were both blind to who he really was. And this is why you need community. Because the truth of the matter is, we like not knowing each other. We don't like to not be known but we do like not knowing each other because we want to travel light. I don't want to know everybody's baggage. You're like, Travis, you picked an interesting profession. <laughs> but it's like, no, we don't want to know all that stuff. We don't want to deal with all that. I like being able to wave to somebody and not carry a Rolodex. That's uh, a thing that used to keep numbers in it. <laughs> I keep a Rolodex of information in people's head, in my head. I don't want to do that. If we are allowed to, we will blitz through life without ever knowing people. And that is why church is important. It's why coming here is being important. It's why being here is important. Is because it forces you to stop just for a moment and be around people, getting in a connect group, getting in a small group, so that people get to know you. 
and you get to know them. If we don't take intentional time to do it, it won't happen. In the same way, if you don't take intentional time to work out, you will not develop a six pack. Unless you're like 17 and your metabolism is through the roof. You've got to take that time. The second application is this. It is possible for us to do the very same things that Peter and Caiaphas did to Jesus. To see him, but to not know him. To spend time with him, but to not get it. It's a scary thought. When it comes to faith, let me back off that. When it comes to science, the way that we understand things in our world is we observe it and then we know it, right? Right? Like that's the scientific method. We make observations and then we know something. We test it and we know it. But when it comes to faith, when it comes to following Jesus, it's the reverse. You know something first and then you get to see it. I was reading in our dwell readings this week, uh, Luke chapter two. So the Christmas story and the, uh, the shepherds see the angels in the sky and there's a celebration. And then after the angels leave, they look at each other and you know what they say to each other? They say, let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has been made known to us. Let's go see what we already know. And that is faith. That is following Christ. You open up his word. God reveals, shows you something from his word. He tells you to do something. You get a sense you need to forgive that person or you need, to, you need to say you're sorry to that person or you need to move on from your job or you need to be more generous or whatever it is. And you're like, God, I see you telling me that. I know that's what you want me to do, but I don't see how it's gonna work. And God says, take the first steps and I'll show you what you already know. And that's why you have to be in his word because you will know Jesus first before you really see him for who he is. And that's what following Christ is now. Once you become a Christian, you continue to grow in your knowledge of him and you get to see him more and more working throughout your life. If you don't see Jesus working in your life, it might be because you don't know him as well as you think you do. But it's not just enough to be seen and not known. Sometimes we're heard and we're not understood. We're heard and we're not understood. Verse 61, go back up there. At last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. Jesus makes two statements that are misunderstood. The first one, we already studied a little bit, the whole destroying the temple thing. Jesus actually said this. He says it in John chapter two. And people get really upset about it because they're like, it took 46 years to build this temple. How are you gonna destroy it and then rebuild it in three days? But John tells us that Jesus is not talking about the physical building of the temple. He's talking about his body. He's talking about himself. He says, I'm going to destroy this temple. Again, it's interesting that he says he's the one to destroy it, not somebody else. He's the one that lays down his life. Nobody kills him. He lays his life down. That's important. He says, I'm going to destroy this, and it's going to get raised to life three days later. And they misunderstand what he says. They completely misunderstand it. And it's interesting that those very words this kind of pseudo prophecy that he's making about it is a prophecy that he's making about his own body is what gets him convicted and killed. The second thing he says happens when he actually talks. Caiaphas takes a vow. He's like, I need you. I basically kind of, a, I swear that if you don't tell me and Jesus says, look, you want to call me the Messiah. You want to call me the son of God. That is, you are welcome to use those terms but let's get one thing straight. What you mean by that word and what I mean by those words are completely different. And that's why he says, you have said so. He's saying, your use of the word Messiah is different than my word of the use Messiah, right? It's like the princess bride. The guy keeps saying inconceivable. And Inigo Montoya is like, I do not think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's like, you keep saying Messiah, but I don't think you know what that word means. We're digging into all the like late 80s, early 90s movies today, man. <laughs> Jesus is selling Caiaphas, you are way more, I am way more than you can consider, way more than you can handle. 
This is why he tells him he's the son of man. We'll talk about this more next week, but Messiah is one title. Son of man's another that's a greater title. And son of man comes from Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14. Daniel's having a vision and he says, verse 13, I saw in the night visions and behold the clouds of heaven. There came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You know what Jesus is claiming here? To have a unique relationship with the Lord that allows him to share in God's rule and reign of all things. And this is what drives Caiaphas over the edge. This is why he rips his robes, which is, uh, was not supposed to happen. You were never supposed to rip the high priestly garments. Because Jesus is claiming to have a special relationship with God. And according to Jewish understanding of blasphemy, it's not just taking the Lord's name in vain. It's not just uh, saying wrong things about God or anything like that. When you claim to have a unique relationship with God, that is blasphemy. That's what they're saying is blasphemy. And he says, you don't need to... You don't need to know anything else about it. This is what Caiaphas blows a gasket about it. And the most tragic part about this is that these are his people. These aren't Romans or Persians or Greeks confusing him. These are Gentiles that are misunderstanding him. These are people who are supposed to know who he is. They're supposed to understand what he says. They're supposed to be steeped in like his common knowledge. They're supposed to give him the benefit of the doubt, but instead they misunderstand what he says. And this shows us that the most misunderstandings we have are not with strangers, but with people we spend a lot of time with. And those misunderstandings are way more damaging with people who are close to us than a misunderstanding that happens with a stranger. This is because we think about what we say with a stranger more than we think about what we say with the people close to us. We say things off the cuff, we take things for granted, <clears throat> and we wind up hurting people. That's why you make a flippant comment at work and it doesn't seem to bother anybody. You make the same flippant comment at home and it seems to bother people. This is why you can talk about a somewhat rude comment somebody made to you on a first date years ago and it doesn't bother you to talk about it. It's funny. But you can't talk about the somewhat rude comment that your mom or your dad or your spouse or your longtime significant other says to you. It hits different. Those misunderstandings happen with people that are close to us way more. And that's what's happening here. There's a misunderstanding of Jesus' words. Social media doesn't make it any better. How many people have been canceled or had to dig back through their tweets to make sure, man, I hope I didn't say anything? Dude, if you put it on the internet, it's out there forever, right? Like, it's going to last longer than, like, some inscriptions on stones. Just saying. Social media is a place where we're seen and not known and where we are heard and often misunderstood. It's a dangerous place out there. On the other hand, you can go through a season of life and feel like you're not understood, right? Being a single adult in a culture that idolizes and worships sex and romance is incredibly difficult. You can feel like you're less than or other than. You can feel like you're not even in the same, same music symphony that everybody else is playing, right? And then you go to church which doesn't seem to idolize families at all. That was a joke. We very much do. <laughs> Where you can feel like you have half a voice because you don't have this significant other. On the other hand, you have young moms. I've never been a young mother myself, but I've lived with one. I guess technically I lived with two. I don't remember the first one. And you have this new life and your husband maybe takes some time off to be with you, but then hey, he has to go back to work. And you're like, yeah, I understand. You, we, we need to eat. Go. And you're left with this child, and you're like, I don't, nobody knows what I'm going through. You've got all these emotions going on. You're, you're kind of coming down off, off all those hormones that get going when you're, when you're pregnant. Again, please, I've never been there, so please be patient with me. But it's just a very easy time to feel like everybody misunderstands you because nobody really does know what you're going through. It's this unique experience that you have, so much so that I actually cannot talk about it. There are all sorts of others where it's easy to be misunderstood. But here's the thing. Jesus is sitting there in 30 AD. He's sitting there to get rid of misunderstandings. So that there'll be no more misunderstandings. One day he will return to set up a new kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth, where there will be no more misunderstandings. 
where you want, imagine a world where you don't have to qualify what you say. Imagine a world where you don't have to say things like, one, I'm sorry. Imagine a world where you don't have to say things like, well, what I mean by that is, or hey, I don't mean to sound rude, but. Imagine that kind of a world. I'll talk like 30% less. And you're like, that would be really nice, Travis. You could try to do that and doing that now. We'll get to lunch sooner. Jesus is coming to end misunderstandings. And that's why he sat on that floor in that house and took the beating he took so that we'd stop misunderstanding one another. And for those of us who have always felt misunderstood or always have felt like we don't have a voice, you get to rule and reign with Christ. It tells us in 2 Timothy 2 that we get to reign with Christ. And if you don't feel like you have a voice, maybe you're black or Hispanic or, or, or a woman and, and you just feel like historically having a voice has just been lost. And the church hasn't maybe done a good job with that either. Christ comes and says, that's not the way it's supposed to be and that's not the way it will be in my kingdom. And so when you are misunderstood, I would love to give you like five ways to communicate so you're not misunderstood anymore. And that would be great, but here's the thing. It doesn't take away the hurt that comes from being misunderstood. That hurt still stays with us. And so the only thing I can give you now is hope that one day we'll have a place where we are heard and understood at the foot of Christ. It's not sometimes just that we're seen and heard. We're also judged. We're judged but not accepted. Look at verse 66. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. And then they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? At the end of it all, Jesus is convicted. He is condemned to die. And the Romans will carry it out. And you can see the escalation that takes place. They slapped him last week one time. Now they're slapping him and using closed fists to hit him. In a couple weeks, they're going to flog him, tear the skin from his back, and then after that, they're going to nail him to a cross. Stick a spear in his side. Like I said, Jesus is condemned by the very people he's supposed to set free. Just a few chapters ago, he weeps over Jerusalem, and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to love you and care for you like a mother hen carries, cares for her chicks, but you're the one who kills the prophets. And here again, we find ourselves being able to apply this in a couple of different ways. One, and, and I don't know how much this relates to what we're talking about, but it's something I couldn't get out of my head this week, was where this all takes place. This judgment takes place in Caiaphas's house. The most famous thing that happens on that floor, under that roof, is the death or the con condemnation, the judgment and the beating and abuse of Jesus Christ, the Savior. That's the most famous thing that happens there. Let me ask you this, what happens in your home? What is your home known for? How is Christ treated there? Is he honored? And by honored, I mean, is he, are the people in your home treated well? Is forgiveness sought and requested and offered? Is sorry thrown, away, thrown around in an appropriate manner? Is it a house of generosity? Jesus turns over tables in, in his temple and he says, my house is to be a house of prayer. Is your house a house of prayer? Or is it a place where Jesus is abused? And by that I mean, how are the images of God treated, other people treated? Are they treated kindly? Are they treated callously? Is it a place where yelling takes place and frustration is exhibited in ways that aren't appropriate? Are sexual images looked at regularly and often in your home? You might say, well, what does that have to do with treating Christ appropriately, Travis? Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, it says to unite your body to a prostitute is to unite the members of Christ to the prostitute. What, the, what he's saying there, and it's very graphic, he's saying it's essentially like taking Jesus to a strip club with you. That's an awkward image, but that's essentially what it's saying. How do you treat the image of God in your home? Are you glorified or is Christ glorified in your home? Your home is the most important location of discipleship for you and anyone that comes under your roof. It's not here. And I love you being here and we want you to be here and we can help you. But the most important place is your house. Not just for kids, but for everybody. You will only grow in Christ as much as your house is a house of worship. That's a fact. 
The second application is that it's very easy to be judged by other people. It's very easy to be judged without even being seen, without even being acknowledged. Many of us get judged that way. It's hard. It's difficult. And sometimes when we judge that way, we, we get driven to despair. Because you feel like the only way people see you is this certain way, right? Like no matter how much you diet or exercise, people still view you as the overweight person, right? No matter how much you try to uh, fix your past or make up for your past, people still view you as this screw up, this failure, this person who has a history. When you feel that need to be driven to despair because of all of that, because of being judged, let it drive you to Christ instead. Go to him and say, Lord Jesus, they're doing it to me again. And you know what he'll say? He'll say, I know they did it to me too. He said, but if you trust me, if you give me your life, I'll sit there on that floor with you. Just like I sat on that floor in Caiaphas' house and took those blows, I'll take those blows with you. And one day you'll live in a world where you won't have those blows anymore. Jesus died so that we might be known, understood, and accepted. And the most important thing for you in your life is to be known and accepted by your creator. You will never be understood nor accepted by his creations until that takes place. There'll always be this kind of break between you and others. Knowing Christ isn't gonna fix all of it, not until he returns, but it certainly won't happen until you give him your life. Put your trust in him, give him your, give him your life. Because he wants to know you. He wants to understand you and he wants to accept you. And you do that by accepting him. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us through your word that we can be known by you and we can be accepted by you. And that that leads us to know you more and more. And Lord, we desperately want to know you. Even if we don't know that, even if we don't sense that, even if we don't really get this whole faith thing, Lord, that thing that we, we can't put our finger on, that's our desire for our creator to know that we were made for you. And so God, I pray that you would put your finger on that place in our heart. That's at the, to this point has been untouched by your grace and you would break down the walls around it and you would make dead things come alive. Thank you, Lord. Amen.